many thanks uh, for having me here. This was a great day, and um, I am sure you are already a bit tired. <laughs> um, I think this was a great presentation also for preparing for my presentation. You will see this. There are many links to this to my presentation. Um, so do I have my slides? Ah, yeah. So in the last panel, there was, or in the last presentation, about Internet of Things and the huge, uh, um, really, um, increase in data through Internet of Things. And I would like to talk really about governance of data. And um, this will be very close to certain questions that have been discussed um, right now. Um, now, Internet of Things, you all know, it's connected smart devices, so producing data and processing data. And we have a lot of examples here, a smart home, smart TVs, um, also in smart manufacturing, uh, where you have a lot of uh, firms with integrated uh, uh, information systems, uh, smart agriculture, where agricultural machines are in the meantime collecting a lot of data. And the question is, who get access to these data? Only the manufacturers or also the, the farmers? Um, smart retailing is a very uh, important uh, new development, smart cities. And what is, I think it's very important to understand, and I think um, we haven't really been very aware about the consequences, is that um, IoT will be everywhere. So everywhere where you are in the offline world, there will be also smart devices who are collecting data from you. So it's not more the world that you are locked in and locked out. But the offline world will be increasingly integrated into the online world. And this has uh, huge consequences. Now, what are kind of regulatory challenges now to IoT? And one is really certainly about here uh, security liability. So we have a lot of problems with that even minimum standards of security are not fulfilled with many devices that are, that are sold. And this is a huge problem. Uh, in, in regard really to cybersecurity, and this is connected to the liability questions. The other important problem is interoperability. So the idea is that all these devices are connected, but then you need standards and you need interoperability. And this often does not work very well because many manufacturers have their own proprietary systems. So this is also an important aspect of um, regulatory questions. The other is privacy data protection. We have talked a lot about that already. And what I focus on mostly is now really data ownership. And uh, Valerie has said a lot about data ownership already, which I entirely agree. Uh, data access, and what I like to call it data governance, because this is a very general term. And um, this is what uh, I would like to focus on. Now, only some basic facts about uh, so data governance, you can see, is, is a kind of the whole set of, of rights. So if you think from a property right perspective, a bundle of rights, but also all kind of legal rules which are dealing really with data. And you ask, what is an, an optimal set of these rights and rules in a very abstract way? And you know, we, we have then in Europe personal data, non-personal data, and GDPR defines set of rights, and this is exactly this is what already has been presented, so I it will be brief. Uh, important is, I think, also to emphasize that um, my impression is that there are many open questions in the regard to EU data protection rules, what this really means. And also, we have also legislative exemptions to the consent principle, uh, so we have here balancing interest, um, Article uh, 61F, um, the question of anonymization and what are the requirements for anonymization. And all these things are not clearly defined so far. And so far, we, I think we have uh, still many problems here uh, about defining exactly this set of rights. Important also, as an economist, you have EU privacy is a fundamental right. And so there might be, from an economic perspective, a trade-off with economic efficiency. And this is also what we have to take into account if we think about from an economic perspective on this. In the garden non-personal data, that's exactly the discussion we already had. Uh, so far, we have, for many data, especially sensor data from IoT, we have no property in a formal legal sense. So ideas then, do we have, do we need perhaps a new right about this? 
And this is something, this is exactly the question where lawyers have drawn me in as a debate two years ago about the question, do we need a new IP right, uh, IP-like right on data? And I think from an economic perspective, uh, this is not necessary and it uh, makes more problems than solves problems. Um, and the interesting thing is, and then the discussion shifted very fast from the idea of, of exclusive right to access rights in the discussion. And um, because many data are de facto exclusive data, that's exactly what uh, Valerie Ori has, has explained. Um, and therefore, there's a kind of de facto ownership, which is not a legal ownership. Yeah, but it's very important in economic effects. Now, in regard to Internet of Things uh, context, we often have the situation that we have what I call a multi-stakeholder problem. So we have an ecosystem of an IoT, and there might be a number of firms in this ecosystem which would like to use the same data. And in this context, it might not be optimal, also from an economic perspective, that one firm in this ecosystem is an exclusive uh, data holder and said we might need more complex data governance solutions for solving this. And this is uh, what I would like to show you now with a very specific example, and this is data in connected cars. And this is what is mostly my presentations will be about, about this current discussion about how the data governance should look like in regard to what's called in-vehicle data. So if you look at uh, data in connected cars, then you see that uh, we as a connected car have all this in vehicle data, and you know it's data about driving behavior, it's data, it's, it's technical data about the car itself, it's also data about road conditions, weather conditions, traffic conditions, and there's a huge amount of data generated, and um, there are many other kind of, of now um, firms which are interested and would like to offer services to the car users but they need access to these kind of data. Yeah? This might be uh, aftermarket services, this might also be other complementary services, as navigation services or something like that, uh, but also insurance companies, public authorities. And the question is now, how is this organized with these data? Now, there are three different um, models discussed. This is also a discussion we had in Europe, and, and I only um, uh, show it to you, and what is now used in Europe and also really promoted by the European car manufacturers, especially the German ones, is the extended vehicle concept. And the extended vehicle concept is a very specific concept, and this means that all data are transmitted directly to an external proprietary server of the car manufacturer. And they have, therefore, exclusive de facto control of these data. Yeah? And this is what we already have. And they also have an exclusive control about the access to the connected car itself. So this is the IT system. This is the second problem. Yeah? And this leads to the following situation. Uh, what we have, this is the vehicle manufacturers. And um, they have uh, uh, exclusive control about this proprietary external server with all these data and also controls the access to the car itself. Yeah? And all other stakeholders, right? Um, if they want to get access to data, they have to go to the vehicle manufacturers, and without their consent, they don't get any access. Now, there are different kind, another kind of um, solution would be you have still an external server where all these in vehicle uh, data are really tra transmitted, but this external server is not under the control of the vehicle manufacturer, but under the control of a neutral entity, whatever this is. Yeah? And then this neutral entity could give non-discriminatory access. This is a second model, model which is discussed. The same technical solution, still transmitting to an external server, but the external server is under the governance of a neutral entity instead of the vehicle manufacturer. So it's very clear. This now solves uh, a lot of problems in regard to access to um, in vehicle data, but not the problem of access to the car itself. It's still a closed system technically. Now, the third possibility is, and this is in the so called onboard application platform, that's a, um, and this is um, as a technological solution, 
So the data are directly stored in the car. So the car itself, it's a platform. And also, and this would mean that the car owners or car drivers would have control about the access to their own car, both in regard to the access to the car itself from a technical perspective, but also control about the data in the car. Yeah, and this is a so-called um, here on board application platform, and you can also call it an interoperable open telematics system. And these are the three models that are discussed in Europe the last three, yeah, three years, perhaps. And, but what we have is the extended vehicle concept. Now, from this situation, we got a really important and, and controversial policy discussion. Uh, on one hand, it's very interesting. I was on a conference in Brussels about this. On one hand, it's the vehicle manufacturers. And on the other side are all other stakeholders. <laughs> so a very clear situation. And as uh, independent service providers, they complain about this privileged access, about this monopolization of these specific data. Um, and they would like to, and this has consequences then to the aftermarket, so I come back to this. And this might have negative effects on competition, innovation, and consumer choice in regard to these aftermarkets. And they call for legislative action by the commission. On the other hand, the vehicle manufacturers say, this is a very simple problem. This exclusive access and control is necessary because of safety and cybersecurity reasons. Yeah, we have no choice. We have to do it in that way. And no regulatory action needed. Yeah. Um, the EU has done a lot. They say uh, there is this uh, cooperative um, intelligent transport system initiative of the, where they really brought all these stakeholders together and had some uh, consensus on some principles. And then they commissioned uh, especially a study. Um, this is this TRL study, which is a very comprehensive study about this whole problem. And this study came to the uh, to the, to the uh, result that we have considerable problems in regard to competition, and they uh, really um, think that the principle of fair and undistorted competition is, is really here violated, and they suggest, at least in the long term, a transition to such an onboard application platform. Now, the European Commission, they have acknowledged that they have a problem, yeah? But so far, they have not really taken action, really doing something. They would like to do a bit of a recommendation um, and, and uh, voluntary measures. Uh, but in the end, it's an unsolved uh, open policy question in the European Union. Now, what I have done. So I have uh, written a bit about that. And on one article is this uh, in, in Chipitec, um, uh, end of year, last year. Um, I have thought a bit about how can I structure this from an economic perspective, this problem. Yeah? And I asked about, and, and the most important question from economists is, can we rely on market competition, really uh, finding the best solution for the governance of this in vehicle data? Or do we have some kind of market players? That's exactly my, my question. Um, now, what's very important, and I think, generalizable also to other kind of IoT context is that very important is our technological decisions. Because the technological decision for this extended vehicle concept through the uh, car manufacturers leads really to this exclusive monopolistic control about the in-vehicle data and de facto to a kind of appropriation of these in-vehicle data. And this leads also to a closed system. So what you also have is the same what you have with your iPhone. Yeah, you cannot uh, uh, upload an, another app, which is not from the, the, the Apple App Store. This is therefore a closed technical system. Uh, this is the same um, it would also be in, in this extended vehicle concept. So in that respect, what the European um, car manufacturers would try to build up is a closed ecosystems of connected driving. This is what they want, and they also think about monetizing these data. And um, if we would have an onboard application platform as a different technology solution, then we would have a different kind of, of consequence, because then the car, car owners would have the control, the exclusive control about the, the access to data in the car. 
and therefore the car owners would be the de facto owners. So in that respect, I think it's from an economic perspective very interesting that the choice of technology decides about the initial allocation of de facto control rights of data. This is the first point. The second is now the safety and security argument. I don't want to go into details, um, only briefly. Um, so the car manufacturers, uh, is, it's in fact their only argument that um, is that it's necessary because of safety and security reasons. Now, the technical experts discuss this very controversially, and many think that perhaps an, an open, inable matics platform with a multi-layered safety and security system, where you use all the certifications, might even have lead to more safety and security instead of a proprietary system. So this is an open technical question. But what's more important from my perspective, and um, that even if you think that an exclusive technical control uh, is necessary because of safety, then this does not justify at the same time why they are also uh, appropriating these data, because this is something very different, a very different problem. And therefore, um, the technical and commercial control of data can be unbundled. This is something, it's very different kind of problems. And therefore, I think safety and security reasons do not justify this exclusive control of illegal data. What I'm doing then in, in, um, is looking at possible market failure problems. And um, so the first one is uh, exactly what the independent service providers have uh, complained all the time, uh, that this exclusive control has a lot of problems in, because it leads to foreclosure effects and foreclosure strategies. Uh, in, in on aftermarkets um, and also on other, other markets for complementary services in this ecosystem of um, uh, connected driving. So they can monopolize aftermarket and complementary services um, or sell the access to these markets to other firms. Yeah? Um, and this would lead to, to high monopolistic prices. So I think the, con the concerns about foreclosure of independent service providers is justified. Um, from an economic perspective, however, you have to ask one important question, always of aftermarkets. What about competition between vehicle manufacturers? Yeah? And this is about the question of whether system competition, systems competition might work. So you can think about that you still have the choice uh, buying a Mercedes with all these aftermarkets and the whole ecosystem or buying a BMW with that. Yeah, and, the, and there is competition between them. So the question is, how well does the system competition work? Um, and I want, don't want to get into this, but this is from an economic uh, perspective an important uh, question. I think it is very doubtful um, that the system competition would work very well um, because the consumers cannot assess very well this entire bundle, especially also for future services. So the, I think there is a problem. The second potential market failure in this ecosystem is now uh, a topic we also have discussed already today a bit. And this is a question, uh, the relationship between the vehicle manufacturers and the consumer. Because what you have, what you are, if you are buying a connected car, you do not buy anymore a car only. You are buying a complex bundle of the car itself, but also of contracts about services updates because you need, server, you need update software updates also in the future for so your connected car. And therefore, you are much more locked in, in, in uh, when you buy a car than in a traditional car. And, and one part of this contract relationship is also the consent to the vehicle manufacturers to use the personal data. So this privacy aspect is also part of this, these contracts. And then you can ask the question, uh, which we ask also in, in, in regard here to, to Google and Facebook, uh, can these consumers make rational informed decisions about this, uh, the problem of salience, um, of the price of the data, uh, this is what, we, what we heard, how, this is exactly also here important. Um, do car users have a real choice about this? And do vehicle manufacturers offer enough granular privacy options for different privacy preferences? Or is this a zero one decision? Yeah. Um, and very important from a legal perspective, do notice and consent solutions really work? And um, I think there's a huge problem uh, in regard to this. And this is, I think, also in regard to connected cars. 
And then there's, I think, might be a third market failure, and that's about technological choice. Um, because you can say, OK, if you see that uh, and the market has all these extended needles, and this is surviving somehow in the market, isn't this the most efficient solution? Because it's surviving in the market as a technology solution. The question is now, can there be market failures? And we all know that in regard here to interoperability and also the standardization, which is here very important, there might be market failures and that market, markets might not uh, really find the best solutions for that. So this is so one problem is really that you might end up with too close proprietary systems with not enough interoperability. Yeah with lock-in effects uh, for users that impede and competition innovation on these secondary markets. This is a one problem, and we have a lot of economic analysis about this. And the other problem is a traditional standardization problem. And, and what you have to see, if you look now at, uh, at um, in the long term, we, we, what we want is a kind of an integrated mobility system in the sense, also in the end, autonomous cars. And in this system, we need, in any case, uh, interoperable interfaces and standards because you also need communication between vehicles and vehicles and infrastructure. So these all these safety security problems about interoperable telematic system have to be solved anyway. So I think these proprietary systems might not be a good idea in the long term in any case um, for here, here, uh, so, uh, mobility systems. In that respect, uh, open interoperable telematic platforms might be superior to proprietary closed systems. Um, and it might be that the market has problems really in coming to the solution alone only to through competition. Usually, therefore, we have collective standard, set standard setting for actually solving these kind of problems. Now, my result is, and this is a very preliminary result, so it's necessary to go much deeper investigating this, but as I say, therefore I'm cautious and say these are potential market failure problems, but I think there is a good um, uh, hint that, that this is uh, really a problem. So, so one is the competition problems on the aftermarket and complementary services. The other is information privacy problems. And the third one, the problems with optimal technological change choice. Um, my conclusion is that I think this extended vehicle concept, as it is propagated and really used uh, in Europe, uh, might not be the best solution, and we should uh, uh, look for better solutions. Now, what I do not present is what is now the best as a solution. <laughs> because the governance of data is a very complex issue, also because there are very different kinds of data. I have not talked about this. Yeah, We are talking about very different kinds of data, and therefore, um, this is not easy to say what is now a good solution. It's also interesting, hold it in, the, in the whole discussion, uh, there has never been developed a really good alternative solution so far. So this is really an open question. Um, but the basic idea is really searching for a data governance solution that is superior to this idea that only one stakeholder has this exclusive control. And then you are exactly about the discussion about access to data as, as one of the solutions and that can, you can think about how to do this. Now in my last slides, here is, uh, I think, three. Um, I only discuss now a bit what might be possible options to do that. Yeah, and this is it says relates very much what, what you also have have told us. So the one is really about um, data rights and data portability. So data portability is the idea that perhaps if, if the car owners could use this kind of data portability right for getting data back from the vehicle manufacturers and giving it to other service providers, this might be a solution solving the data access problems. But in fact, um, it is very hard. Um, this is unclear as the extent of this right, also legally, and also the practicability of this solution. So it's not clear whether this is working or what we have to do to make it work. Then you can think directly about um, introducing through legislation data access rights. So the ones that is what you also, also mentioned. Uh, this new kind of exclusive right. This is the data producer right. Uh, from the European Commission, uh, which has been discarded uh, in the meantime as, as a solution. Um, the other would be defining directly data access rights in these kind of uh, situations, but this is very hard to do in a general way. 
So I think this is not, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's too hard to do in a general way and solve the problems. Now, what I find very interesting is competition law solutions. Um, so my main field is really competition policy. <laughs> I come from that perspective. And um, you all know, um, as you can see, the refusal to grant access to in vehicle data as an abusive behavior. And thinking from that perspective on that. Yeah. And what um, I was last year involved in a, in a study for the German Ministry of Economic Affairs about uh, modernization of um, the law on abusive behaviors of firms of market power. This was uh, preparation for the upcoming 10th amendment of the German competition law. And we had in this uh, study, we have uh, a large, uh, a considerable part was about access to data, exactly these kind of questions on a general way, not about car data, but in a general way, but also we focused directly also on IoT and aftermarket problems. Um, now you can think about um, Article 102. Yeah, um, you all know uh, uh, the, uh, the jurisprudence, um, uh, McGill and, and others. Um, and usually uh, we know that um, the requirements uh, really for applying the essential facility doctrine is are very high, so it's not easy to apply this. But from an economic perspective, you can make a good argument that the essential facility doctrine can be um, applied much more flexible in regard to data, because data is not protected by an IP right, but also the costs of producing data might be very different. And if the costs of producing data are very low, then the balancing between the benefits of sharing the data through a special facility doctrine and uh, the problem of incentives for producing data will lead more that you uh, really make more data accessible. So in that respect, um, the essential facility doctrine can be used much more uh, flexible. And then we discussed another uh, solution and also made, made uh, proposals for amending the German competition law. And this is using a very specific German um, uh, provision, that's paragraph 20 of the German competition law about the relative market power. So where firms are bilaterally dependent from each other. Um, I think it has a similar provision in French competition law. And uh, the idea is that we can also use this. And we have the idea that might be that we develop new case groups and, and also in this paragraph 20 and also amending the paragraph 20 for facilitating. I don't want to go into the details. So I think competition law can facilitate this, but practically it's difficult because uh, it's always exposed and it's, it's hard really to, um, uh, to implement that. So I th think that the best solution might be really looking for a, a sector-specific solution really for the ecosystem of economic dr of connected driving, uh, which can really also try to, to um, uh, tailor a governance uh, um, structure to the complexity of the system. Yeah, and this would Im the point is we already have a sector-specific regulation about access to technical information for repair and maintenance services. This already exists but it's not adapted to the new connected car situation. Uh, and we could build on that. And this sector-specific regulation could consist of a kind of a front-like exit rights for protecting competition, sp perhaps specific rules on protecting privacy and inform informed consent in this ecosystem of connected driving, and perhaps also technological regulation, perhaps especially also the security standards. So I think this might be the most suitable option. My last remark is um, IoT contexts are very, very different. And therefore, what we really have to think about, um, we, in each IoT context, you have to make a different analysis, and especially economic analysis, about the benefits and uh, the costs of different kinds of governance options. And this was only an example here for the individual data, um, how to deal with that. But this uh, could be applied also to other kind of IoT contexts. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wolfgang.